All right, everyone. Today, we're going to talk about the dark, very dark side of calorie restriction. I wanted to start with this kind of cool study. This was done in rats. What's happening here, This there's two groups. This orange line, the, these are rats who were calorie restricted. And so... Uh, you can see this is uh, these are the two groups of rats. Uh, this is just the acclimation phase, and you can see they have about the same body temperature. Now, during this time here where it says semi-starvation, the rats were given about half of their normal calories, and you can see that their body temperature plunges uh, by about a degree centigrade, or nearly a degree centigrade. That's almost two degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and then they they return the rats to the normal diet, the same amount of, they're getting the same amount of feed till the end of the experiment. But you can see that their body temperature never rebounds. They have a permanently lowered body temperature. And that's interesting because the body temperature of Americans and really all modern humans has dropped by around a degree Fahrenheit in the last hundred years. And I've shown that study a bunch of times. This is just another look at that, that paper. You can see uh, this is the number of calories they're eating. So in the beginning here, and sort of ignore this light gray group, um, there's two groups here. In the beginning, they're eating the same. And then here's the semi-starvation where down here, they're getting half the number of calories. And then after that, you can see they're now eating the same number of calories. During this time, look what happens. So this is lean mass. So these, uh, these rats are stunted. And so they're, uh, they're, they, they're smaller, um, when they start refeeding them and, but they gain lean mass at about the same rate if they have the same amount of food, but look what happens to fat mass. Uh, the mice who are semi starves are, are preferentially adding fat mass over time. And, and you can see they're, they're kind of catching up. Um, this is the, the rats on the regular amount of feed the whole time. And these rats are kind of catching up, but they're mostly catching up by adding fat because why? Because they were semi-starved for this time period. So we can say that calorie restriction causes uh, fat gain, right? Calorie restriction causes later fat gain is what these rats are showing. And they're doing it by lowering metabolic rate. I asked the question in the last video, what do these diets have in common? I said the keto diet, uh, fasting, a calorie restriction, and the Mediterranean diet all do one thing. And I'm going to add in on this one, eating at McDonald's, they all do one thing. And that is they activate PPAR alpha. Or you just saw that those rats that were calorie restricted, their body temperature lowered. And this is an experiment uh, in mice. And they gave them a bezofibrate is a pharmaceutical that activates PPAR alpha what you can see is that their body temperature, this gray line is lower than the black line, which is mice, uh, just without having an activated PPAR alpha. So I'm arguing that one of the reasons that the body temperature lowered in those mice is that by restricting calories, you activated PPAR alpha. What is PPAR alpha? I've been talking a lot about it. Nuclear receptors are in all of your cells. We have 48 of them. And what they do is they're sensing both internal and external. The word is ligands. I hate that word, um, but that's the word that we have. And ligands can be a whole bunch of things. Um, they can be anything from, so uh, for example, the estrogen receptor is a nuclear receptor that senses estrogen, which obviously the estrogen is released by your body. So that would be an internal ligand of a nuclear receptor. What the nuclear receptors do when they're activated by their ligand is they go into the nucleus and they turn on other genes. Um, and so they're controlling the they're controlling the expression of of uh, potentially hundreds of other genes to affect change in the cell, obviously based on um, whatever the signal that they've sensed is coming from uh, coming from the inside of the organism or coming from the outside of the organism. And so some of these nuclear receptors include uh, the PPARs. And today we're going to talk about PPAR alpha, but there are three PPARs. There's also PPAR gamma and PPAR beta, delta, beta slash delta. Um, this one is the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. This one, uh, if you watch my videos, you've heard me talk about a lot. It's activated by something called kinurinine. It's activated by certain uh, oxidized phospholipids. Those would be internal signals. It also acts to things called 
pyrobenzene and TCDD, which are organic pollutants uh, that, that people wind up ingesting. This one is uh, the vitamin D receptor. Uh, we've all heard of vitamin D. Um, we can make it internally or we can get it from our diet, obviously. This is the retinoid X receptor. That's another one that's uh, recognizing vitamin A products. And this one's called the SXR, the steroid X receptor. It's also called the PXR sometimes. It recognizes BPA, um, like that's found in plastics, right? And so uh, this functions similar in some ways to PPAR or AHR. It's another one that's recognizing these external toxins. So PPAR alpha mostly recognizes different kinds of fats. It's activated by omega-3 fats. It's activated when you consume oleic acid. It's also activated by oxidized polyunsaturated fats, such as used fryer oil. And we're going to get to that. What does what does PPA or alpha do when it's activated? Well, it, it increases these genes CPT1A and CD36. These are involved in fat transport into your cells and into your mitochondria. And so when PPA or alpha is activated, your cells will take up more fat, from the bloodstream and they will import it into the mitochondria and that increases fat oxidation. Um, it also activates something called PDK4. PDK4 is directly involved in insulin resistance. It turns off pyruvate dehydrogenase, which is the thing that allows you to burn glucose. We can say that it's involved in fuel switching because if your fat transport genes are turned on and your uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase is turned off, you're going to switch to burning fat and you're going to be unable to burn glucose. And PPAR alpha is involved in the oxidation of polyunsaturated fats. And it does this by upregulating enzymes such as D6D, D5D, and cytochrome P450-4A and 4F, which I will refer to as CYP4. A lot of people talk about oxidized PUFA. I think the idea is that the PUFA is sort of oxidizing because it's in the environment and it's touching oxygen. And that does happen in a cir circumstance like a deep fryer. But once the PUFA are in the body and they come in and it, you know, when they come in intact, which is probably most of the time, uh, they are actually oxidized by our enzyme systems. Lastly, PPAR alpha activates the ACOX1, which is in peroxisomes, and it controls the breakdown of fat in the peroxisomes. And this is a way that PPAR alpha can detox fats that it doesn't like. Uh, like I say, things like branch chain fats, things like long chain omega-3 fats, it can send those to peroxisomes. They do get sent to the mitochondria to get broken down. They get sent to peroxisomes to get broken down and they get oxidized and eliminated through this third route. So how does this detox work? So this is just an example to show that the detox thing is real. Uh, these are mice who are given fish oil and this is a mortality curve. So every time this curve drops, uh, that means a mouse has died. And what happens is this solid line these are mice who don't have the gene PPAR alpha, right? So they can't detox from the fish oil, those marine oils. And so those marine oils kill mice that don't have PPAR alpha. 80% of them are dead by day 12 of, you can see up here, of acute liver failure. So these are mice and they're given oxidized fryer oil. And this is, like I say, that's that uh, CYP4A, that's that cytochrome P450 detoxification enzyme that oxidizes the PUFA. These are given the equivalent amount of soybean oil that's not oxidized. And like I say, the linoleic acid does not activate the PPA or alpha, but oxidized linoleic acid does because oxidized linoleic acid is seen as a toxin. And so you can see this is the fryer oil at, uh, I think it was 5% of calories or 5% by weight, I don't quite remember. This is a higher level of the fryer oil. And this is a pharmaceutical drug, clofibrate, that activates uh, PPAR alpha. And you can see that the level of CYP4A induced by the high dose fryer oil is the same as the pharmaceutical drug that activates PPAR alpha. And so PPAR alpha sees this fat coming in, it's oxidized, we need to get rid of it. It increases CYP4A, the thing that oxidizes the PUFA. So how does this work in the context of actual fats that we eat? Here's linoleic acid up here, uh, starting at the top. And you see there's this enzyme called D6D. I've talked a lot about this. D6D is, guess what, controlled by PPAR alpha. 
uh, D6D puts a double bond into linoleic acid and it becomes GLA. And then there's another desaturase, also controlled by PPA or alpha, that puts a fourth double bond into it. Now it's 24 omega-6 and that is arachidonic acid. Now arachidonic acid is interesting because it's preferentially held in our membranes. And once it's in the membranes, it is a very dynamic player. It can be released from the membranes uh, by this phospholipase. And at that point, there's all these enzymes that can oxidize arachidonic acid into all of these oxidized linoleic acid metabolites or oxylipins. Uh, they're sometimes called, and you can see these ones are called prostaglandins, thromboxanes. These are all ultimately oxidized linoleic acid, right? That's how they started. And the way that they got oxidized is because PPAR alpha was activated. It activated D6D, D5D, and CYP4 to take linoleic acid all the way down to uh, 12 heat, 15 heat, 20 heat, etc. Just an example of this, this is in mice, but they were given clofibrate, the thing that activates PPAR alpha, and you can see that 20 heat increases. This is how detox works. PPAR alpha activates this thing called uh, CYP4, as you've seen. Uh, that's, that's called phase one uh, detoxification. What CYP4 does is it adds an oxygen to these, to these different fats. Um, it can probably do it to aldehydes as well, but it adds an oxygen and that oxygen acts like a handle. And then in phase two detoxification, these other enzymes such as glucuronidases, uh, which guess what, are controlled by PPAR alpha, stick these water soluble molecules onto these fats. And once these uh, water soluble molecules are on the fats, then they become water soluble waste and they can be excreted. And so this is actually how your body gets rid of things like aldehydes. And it's how it gets rid of a lot of the polyunsaturated fat. This is a paper about phase two detoxification. I said that 15 and 20 heat get glucuronidated. Well, you can see here this UGT is UDP glucuronosyl transferase because what it's doing is it's taking this water soluble thing and it's transferring it onto the 20 heat. The 20 heat activates the PPAR alpha. The PPAR alpha activates uh, the UGT. The UGT allows the body to eliminate the 20 heat. Starvation also activates PPAR alpha. And what I really should say is that Reduced insulin signaling activates PPAR alpha. What insulin does is it tells your fat cells to slow down the process of lipolysis, which means releasing fat to the rest of the body. So if you're fasting or if you're reducing calories or if you're doing a keto diet, you're going to have lowered insulin signaling. And that means that lipolysis is going to go up and all of these fresh fats are going to be uh, released into the bloodstream out of your fat reserves. And if your fat reserves are full of things that PPAR alpha is monitoring for, such as long chain omega-3 fats, or uh, if it's very high in oleic acid, that is going to activate PPAR alpha. This is in mice. You can see this is calorie restriction. You see here CYP4A, right? Uh, the calorie restricted mice, CYP4A expression nearly doubles because calorie restriction activates PPAR alpha. This is another very classic PPAR alpha target gene, CPT1A. Uh, so you can see that also is increased by 75% or so during calorie restriction. So we can see the calorie restriction is activating PPAR alpha. This is a human study where they go on a very low calorie diet. Calories in this diet were mostly carbohydrate. I think it was about 500 calories a day, but they're eating a lot less carbohydrate than they were before. Uh, they're activating insulin a lot less, right? And these non-esterified fatty acids, they're also called free fatty acids, uh, go from 0 0.5 at baseline to 1.1. So you have more of a doubling of lipolysis and the release of these free fatty acids. This is a very boring paper. It's just proving the ticky tack fact that the release of these fats by your fat cells does indeed activate PPAR alpha. This just shows that the longer that you fast, the more activated PPAR alpha becomes. You can see these are all PPAR alpha target genes. PDK4 we talked about. You can see with CPT1, this is baseline. This is four hours of fasting. It's a little over 200%. 
After eight hours of fasting, it's at 400%. So that's not even that long. And after 24 hours, it's still over 400% of baseline activity. I should say that these are all in mice. Metabolism in mice happens very fast. Uh, this time frame might be probably slower in humans, I would guess. So the thing about all this is that as PPAR alpha is detoxing PUFA, you have this buildup of products such as 20 heat. And this paper shows that 20 heat interferes with insulin signaling and contributes to obesity driven insulin resistance. And I've shown papers in the past showing that 20 heat and 15 heat and five heat are strongly associated with obesity in humans. This paper is showing what happens if we can't go through this whole pathway. And so these mice don't have this gene D5D. And so in these mice, you cannot make linoleic acid into arachidonic acid. So this shortcuts this whole circuit, right, um, of, of all these things. And so they're looking at PGE2, which is over here on the flow chart. This one here is the null mouse. And you can see PGE2 basically drops to zero if the, if the mouse can't convert uh, linoleic acid to arachidonic acid. These are these same mice. These are the mice who can't create arachidonic acid from linoleic acid and they are protected from diet induced obesity you can see these are the normal mice and their body fat goes from two and a half percent up to seven percent or so and in the mice that can't make these oxidized PUFA that can't make arachidonic acid uh, they simply do not have uh, the same fat gain from the diet induced obesity. You can also see here in the title, they have improved glycemic control. So they're also resistant to the insulin resistance caused by those oxidized linoleic acid metabolites. It's been known that high activity of D6D, uh, this enzyme that again converts uh, LA to GLA in humans predicts bad outcomes metabolically. If you're converting a lot of your linoleic acid to GLA and then onto arachidonic acid, uh, you are likely to have metabolic syndrome, to have diabetes, to have obesity. This is one of those studies. In this study, they actually looked at people's membrane fat composition uh, when they were 50 years old. Then they looked again at who had metabolic syndrome when they were 70. These are the blood levels of LA and GLA uh, at the time that the people were 50, at the beginning of the study. And these are ones who didn't develop metabolic syndrome. And these are ones who did develop metabolic syndrome. And you can see that linoleic acid is a little bit lower uh, GLA is significantly higher and both of these things reach statistical significance. And this is the D6D ratio. Um, you take the GLA, which is the end product and you divide it by the starting product. And that tells you how fast this process is going, right? How fast is this getting made into this? Um, and that's what the D6D index is. And you can see here, that's GLA 18.3 N6. That's linoleic acid 18.2 N6. And you can see this number is higher. It's statistically significantly higher. And so if you're converting more of your linoleic acid into oxidized linoleic acid things, um, you are more likely to develop insulin resistance. This is another study. Uh, all these studies are done in Europe. I rarely see studies about D6D in America. You know, and these were healthy people. They didn't have diabetes or anything. They just took a whole smattering of people and, um, you know, they're going to follow them in this long-term study. But one of the analyses, they just looked at the correlation between D6D activity level and BMI. And there's a strong correlation both in the phospholipids, uh, which means in the cell membranes, and in your fat tissues, your adipose tissues. If you are oxidizing linoleic acid, you are going to be, you're going to have a higher BMI and you're going to be more insulin resistant. And so that brings us to an absolutely phenomenal paper. You can see the names there, Schmerzinska and Music. In this paper, they showed 
you can see weight loss and metabolic health effects from energy restricted uh, Mediterranean and Central European diets in postmenopausal women, a randomized controlled trial. The way I found this trial was to see if there was ever a calorie restriction trial where people looked at the effect on desaturase indexes. And that's what the D6D is, of course. D6D is delta-6 desaturase. What they did in this study was they took postmenopausal women and they put them on a calorie-restricted diet. And you can see right here, uh, calories at baseline were 8.1 megajoules a day and that drops by uh, 2.4 megajoules which is about 30 percent so they consume 30 percent less calories um, you can see the main source of monounsaturated fat they say was rapeseed and linseed oil so from what i can tell and you can see the description of the rest of the diet here um they put a special emphasis on high levels of dietary fiber derived from foods typical of the Central European region, cereals like oatmeal and barley, pulses like peas and beans, etc. They did lower the fat content of the diet a little bit, and they especially lowered, you can see, saturated fat consumption was cut in half, uh, MUFA was cut a little bit, but PUFA consumption goes up. And so we can only assume, because uh, they don't really tell us, that they're using, they're replacing the fat that was in the diet uh, from butter and from meat with these oils. And so I sort of did the math on all these, um, you know, protein goes up a little bit as a percent of the diet, but since energy goes down 30%, that means that overall, um, you know, this is not as a percent of diet. This is overall during this diet, they were eating 28% less protein than they were before. They were eating 25% less carbohydrates than they were before. And since insulin signaling is controlled by carbohydrates and protein, that means they're going to reduce insulin signaling. They're going to have increased lipolysis. They're going to activate PPAR alpha. Um, and furthermore, they're eating a lot less saturated fat, a lot less monounsaturated fat, and they're eating more PUFA. And if that PUFA is linseed oil, they're absolutely going to activate PPAR alpha. This is a paper where they used a bunch of different uh, fats in human liver cells to see which ones activated uh, PPAR alpha. And this one is alpha linolenic acid from flaxseed oil. And you can see that as the concentration of that starts to go up, uh, it massively activates PPAR alpha. And so my supposition when I started to look for these papers and, and found this one is that this calorie restricted diet, especially if you're using flaxseed oil, is going to increase D6D. It is going to increase the oxidation of PUFA. So these are the results. And this is my table out of the paper because they didn't report um, the fats as a percentage of the fats. They only gave the absolute concentrations, which is Confusing if you want to uh, calculate something like uh, delta 60 saturase activity. So at baseline, they had 12.9% uh, of their phospholipids were linoleic acid and 0.6% were alpha linolenic acid. Now you saw that polyunsaturated fats were the only thing on an absolute level that increased when they went onto this new diet. They went up by 23%. We have to assume that 90% of those, uh, of that increased PUFA is from uh, linoleic acid and alpha linolenic acid, right? But after the calorie restriction in the phospholipids, linolenic acid decreases 30% and alpha linolenic acid decreases 50%. So despite the fact that they're eating more of these two things, their levels in the phospholipids plunge. You can see that GLA, and remember the pathway goes from linoleic acid through delta-60 saturase to GLA, right? And so it's, um, I've got it written here, uh, D60 equals GLA over linoleic because it's end product over the starting product. Anyway, you can see GLA uh, goes from 0.24 to 0.55. So it more than doubles despite the fact that there's a lot less linoleic acid around uh, to be converted to GLA. So what that tells us is that the enzyme D6D is massively increased by the calorie restriction um, and probably also by the flaxseed oil. One other very interesting thing is this thing called mead acid, which is a PUFA 
that the body makes increased by seven times. The unique thing about creating, you can see mead acid down here, is it uses all three human desaturases. You use SCD1 to make oleic acid. You use D6D to make um, this 18,2 omega-9, which is not a fat. We really, I don't know what the name of it is. Um, and then we use D5D at the end to make the final mead acid. This is just, this is another study down here. Uh, I was looking at this last night and it popped into my head. This is another study. They gave mice phenofibrate, which is a uh, PPAR-alpha activator. And uh, mead acid went from 0.08% to 0.47%. So that's a, that's a six-fold increase. The increase in mead acid that we saw by using a PPAR alpha activator in mice is actually equivalent to the increase we saw in postmenopausal women when they reduced their caloric intake and ate some flaxseed oil. Um, but what you also saw in those mice, and this is harder to see in this test with the women because uh, you can't look at adipose tissue. Well, I mean, you could look at adipose tissue, but you'd have to do a biopsy. And so usually they only do a blood draw. Um, when you looked at the adipose tissue, stearic acid, so this is uh, SCD1, um, the, that first desaturase enzyme goes from 7.8% down to 5.9%. And oleic acid, the monounsaturated fat, which is at the other end of that reaction, goes from 18% to 30%. So activating PPAR alpha increases D6D in our cell membranes, and that is the easy one to monitor, and that's the one in most of the studies, but what it also does is it activates SCD1 in our liver, and it increases the amount of MUFA in the liver, and it decreases the amount of stearic acid, and it decreases the amount of stearic acid signaling, and that is not great, but the other thing that um, activating PPA or alpha does is it activates something called 2AG. You can see in these mice, it went from 0.16 up to 0.42. 2AG is a cannabinoid. It gives you the munchies uh, and it does all kinds of other things to slow down your metabolic rate. And so what, I, what I'm showing you here is the underlying mechanism by which Caloric restriction lowers your metabolic rate, lowers your body temperature. It does it by upregulating um, the three desaturases. It does it by upregulating these endocannabinoids, and it causes all kinds of metabolic havoc. One really interesting thing that they did in this study was they looked at different genetics. So I'm a firm believer that genetics matter. So what we're looking at here, this is a polymorphism in the the region of the of the genome where d6d and d5d are located and so uh so these variations control the expression of of d6d and d5d the desaturases and so what you can see is people with the cc genotype when they go on the calorie restricted diet that's that's what uh that's what this is this is after the calorie restricted diet their linoleic acid dropped and their gla also dropped and you can see this is uh 33 out of the uh 56 people so this is around 60 percent of the people when they go on the calorie restricted diet it doesn't affect their d6d activity that much but in these people, and this is 40% of the people um, have, have these genotypes. In their case, their D6D activity went up massively. Um, <laughs> you can see uh, linoleic acid levels uh, plunge even more and GLA levels increase. And the 40% of this genotype, of course, are much more likely to be watching this channel <laughs> so you you pro so uh, you're probably highly likely to be in this 40% group. So we're the people that if we restrict calories, we're gonna massively increase oxidation of PUFA. We're gonna wind up with all this 20 heat. We're gonna be insulin resistant. We're gonna have elevated endocannabinoids, which are gonna dysregulate our appetite, etc. This is just another study that they did. All their studies are in Poland. Again, you can see it's music and. Uh, Chmerzynska. <laughs> sorry if I, sorry I got if I got your name wrong. Uh, this is a 2018 paper. Again, they took these postmenopausal women, and they grouped them into either groups of people that uh, had metabolic syndrome or did not have metabolic syndrome, 
And this one did not involve a diet, but what you can see is that D6D activity is higher, significantly higher in those postmenopausal women with metabolic syndrome. So you just see over and over and over again in study after study after study that uh, increased D6D activity is bad news, right? And undeniably, um, that reduced calorie diet massively increased D6D activity in those women. We know that because linoleic acid levels plunged, alpha linolenic acid levels plunged, right? They both, uh, they both dropped massively. And those are the only two things that were increased in the diet of those people, right? Um, we know that because GLA levels increased, they more than double, um, that's a threefold increase in D6D activity. We also saw a big jump in mead acid. And mead acid increases when PPA or alpha is activated, when uh, SCD1, D5D, and D6D are all upregulated, right? It takes all three desaturases to make mead acid. Okay, uh, I just threw a bunch of information at you guys. Uh, let me see if we can just back up and kind of think through this again. So I'm arguing that PPAR alpha's primary role is fat detoxification. PPAR alpha is activated by calorie restriction. It's activated by fasting and it's activated by the keto diet because whenever you do any of those things, you start releasing lots of fat from your fat cells and that is going to activate PPAR alpha who's monitoring which is monitoring all of those fats to see if they need to be detoxified. PPAR alpha is especially activated by oleic acid and the omega-3 fats and so the women on that diet who were given canola oil and flaxseed oil of course um, in addition to the caloric restriction they're also given two fats that activate PPAR alpha and the reason that PPAR alpha oxidizes the PUFA is actually probably to get rid of them. And you saw that that first and second stage detoxification uh, picture that I put up there. The first step of detoxification is oxidizing the PUFA. Um, the downside of the oxidized PUFA is that they cause insulin resistance, at least 20 heat does. Um, and all of those heats, 9 heat, 5 heat, 15 heat, 12 heat, um, they're all involved in the progression of human obesity. 12 heat activates the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. Um, I believe so does 5 heat. Uh, 20 heat recognizes a specific receptor in your cells that makes you uh, insulin resistant. And obviously this is, this is frustrating, right? Because these are... These are the diets that we have, right? Uh, the Mediterranean diet, the keto diet fasting. And what I'm saying is that all of the, we sort of know that all of those diets don't really work in the long term for people. Like none of those diets fix you. I've never heard of anyone doing any of those diets. I mean, there are people on keto and they stay on it their whole lives and they, they are, they seem health, perfectly healthy and perfectly happy. And that's fine. But those people also are not metabolically flexible in the sense that they can go and start eating a bunch of carbs and they'll be healthy forever, right? You know, people who are on a mostly starch-based diet, I see on the other hand, um, tend to stay lean. And what I mean is the traditional um, the, the traditional Chinese diet or the traditional Japanese diet, right? Those are starch-based diets. Uh, the Japanese tend to stay pretty lean. Um, but yet the Japanese can add in um, some meat and they have fish and uh, they have some fried foods. And then you take it to France. You know, French is all, France is also a starch-based diet with baguettes and potatoes, etc. And they add butter on top of that. And they add sugar and they add wine and all kinds of things. But the fact to me, when I look at that French starch-based diet, healthy French people have a lot better metabolic flexibility than people on a keto diet. And so uh, you know, with this video, we're starting to dig into the mechanisms of why that is and why that's true. So in the next video, this should be a lot of fun. We are going to do keto versus the potato hack. So definitely come back.
next week for that one. I think that is going to be a lot of fun. 